You know, the world is moving so fast, at least it feels that way to me, and, and oftentimes I, I just want it to slow down. I, I just want to take a moment, you know, so much change. I mean, call me nostalgic, and at the risk of dating myself, it wasn't that long ago that great music was something that you went to the store to, to buy, and you could pick it up and contemplate that purchase and turn it over and read it uh, before making the purchase, uh, rather than streaming it online. It wasn't that long ago that reaching out to a loved one or a family member and saying, hey, or I love you, was something that you spoke aloud. And, and, and you did so, so with a device plugged into the wall that my son wouldn't even recognize. It wasn't that long ago that coming of age and the personal freedom of the age of 16 came with a driver's license and a set of car keys, not a Snapchat account. Um, and on the political front, you know, it wasn't that long ago that England was a pillar of the EU, and, and this gentleman was a purveyor of fine ties and stakes, and a Democrat. Um, you know, so much change. In fact, amidst all of this change, you know, isn't it often that we feel a bit unstable or a bit unsettled? You know, in college, I studied physics and electrical engineering. And these are two topics that were, are rooted in the sort of scientific method. And the scientific method is all about observations and hypotheses and theorems, and you'd use those things to interpret the natural world. Uh, and it was c tangible concepts, you know, theorems like objects at rest remain at rest unless acted on by an external force. These were concepts that were tangible enough that my engineering-oriented brain could use that sort of as a cloak of, of comfort. That, that was how I felt comfortable in this world of sweeping change. But today, and, and by the way, the scientific method is also a means of predicting the future. But in today's world, you know, the world seems anything but predictable, anything but certain. So the engineering, they wanted a theorem that I could latch onto that would let me feel at place and grounded in this world. And as I look back across the sweep of recorded history, uh, I saw a pattern. Uh, now's not the only time when everything seemed to be changing. In fact, there have been four periods in history where there was sweeping change and change that happened at an accelerated clip. It was if, as if the world moved forward at dog years for some finite amount of time. And in those periods of change, Everything changed, all of the layers of society, forms of government, means of commerce, modes of transportation, the materials of construction, as we heard about earlier today, the distribution and the creation of wealth, and, and literally where and how people worked. Everything would change at these compressed moments. And as I looked deeper at it, the pattern that I saw emerge was that at each of those junctions in history, those periods of radical change seemed to coincide with modes or times when there was a new communication paradigm, and a new energy paradigm. Let me walk you through that. So let's go back to the first instance of this, 10,000 years ago. And the energy paradigm was stored grain. And with the, the ability to store food energy and nomadic culture shifted to, to farmers and cities and towns emerged. And the energy paradigm, I mean, and the communication paradigm was written language. And we evolved from spoken word and you know, transmission of ideas through tribes to scripture. And, and at that point in time, Documents were formed, scripture, you know, religions were put to tablets and disseminated, and again, everything changed. Fast forward now, thousands of years, to the next major revolution point. In our school books, we all know of this as the Industrial Revolution. The new energy paradigm was the steam engine, and for the first time, the ability to harness power to drive steam engines and steam ships and factories. And the communication paradigm was the printing press moving away from monks transferring tablets one at a time to the ability to disseminate ideas far for, for broadly, whether it was religious treatises, political ideologies, or advertising. How do you influence a far larger crowd? And at this point in history, everything changed. Work moved from farm to factory. Wealth began to shift from nobility to merchant class. Everything changed. Step forward again, a somewhat faster clip now, 100 years and uh, we're into the 1870s. The new energy paradigm was oil and its partner, the internal combustion engine, and the communication paradigm was the telephone. Thank you, Alexander Graham Bell. Internal combustion engine let us make power portable, and with that came the car and the airplane. Electronic communication, the telephone, meant that the world that in the past had been distributed by days or weeks or months could suddenly be instantaneously reachable. And with that, again, everything changed. Democracy began to flourish and change at the government level. Work began to move from factory to office. Sweeping change, destabilizing change. So it brings us to today, and I would contend, for any of you who feel a bit unsettled by the recent turns of events over the last months or, or years even, I would contend, take comfort with me in the fact that we are in a period of change like that again. 
And the two paradigms that are shaping this age that we're in now, I'll contend, are sustainability, you've heard a lot about that today, and networked communications in all of its forms. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, but network communications, meaning in my pocket, buzzing periodically, um, I am connected to literally millions, pe millions of people around the world. It's no longer just one-to-one -one on phone, but literally I am connected everywhere. And these two elements, sustainability and network communications, they weave themselves into the DNA of every layer of society that is now being rewritten. Right? So this is a moment for revolutionaries. This is a moment when the crazy ones, as Steve Jobs has popularized, uh, do bold things, when they drive human life forward. You know, Steve talked about the, the crazy ones being those people that are crazy enough to believe that they can change the world, and as such, they are the ones who do. Right? So this is that do-over moment. So while I might feel at times as though the world is rushing at me too rapidly, I turn that around. Rather than being a victim of it, now is the opportunity to be the actor, right? to be the change agent. So um, in these periods of change and judging from the patterns of the past, what can we anticipate? What we can, can we predict? Well, we know that revolution can be sudden. I'll give you an illustration from the transportation revolution at play now, Uber. Invented in 1999 in San Francisco, five years later, Yellow Cab, the industry for transportation by taxi that had existed for 80 years prior, was bankrupt. We also know that revolution can be messy. 200 years ago in Paris, a couple of revolutions ago, they stormed the Bastille. Last summer, they were burning cars and turning them over in response to the transportation revolution. We should brace ourselves. It, there's friction when change happens like this. We also know that revolution is transformative. These are not periods when incremental change happens. These are periods when we completely rewrite the plumbing of society. Again, I'll touch on Uber. The taxi industry in San Francisco before they existed was $140 million. An enormous industry, stable, predictable, reliable. Five years later after Uber, Uber had not only driven Yellow Cab to bankruptcy, but Uber in San Francisco alone was a $500 million industry. This isn't incremental change. This isn't taking market share for business people here. This was completely recreating the notion of an industry, three times larger. We also know that today, with this guiding hand of sustainability as the energy paradigm, that this revolution is sustainable. That means at all levels, in construction, in government, in commerce, in the nature of work, sustainability will leave its fingerprints. And there are countless examples, but here's one that I find incredibly evocative. Um, this is Ollie. Say hello to Ollie. This is a 3D printed, recyclable, electric, autonomous bus that's driving on the streets of Washington, D.C. today. This would not have been conceived of without that silent forcing hand of sustainability. This would not exist or operate without the concept of networked communications. I hail it with an app in my pocket. Today, right? Um, this revolution also is personal, and network communications play into that. A whole host of solutions, many that are familiar to you and many perhaps that, are, that will be new, are now in our pocket that are making this a uniquely personal revolution. Uber, we talked about that, my personal driver. Postmates, if you live in a major city, an app in my pocket that with a tap will bring food from any restaurant I might want to my doorstep in minutes. Upwork, my personal workforce, the ability to reach in my pocket, tap a phone, and reach an employee somewhere on the planet to do a unit of work, an expert that I could hire economically and efficiently. Airbnb, my personal castle, unlocking three million plus and counting properties around the world and unique travel experiences anywhere I might want to go. And I'd say, I'll share with you liquid space, my personal office. Now, this is where I've landed in this age of revolution. This is where my passions have taken me, my personal office. Now, before I delve into the concepts a bit further, let me give you the backstory. Um, now, a quick, quick primer on, on how commercial office works and how it's worked for the last hundred years since the last revolution. Basic premise is commercial office buildings are available for you to put your company in it. Right? And the business model is sign a long-term lease, usually no less than five years, oftentimes 10 years or plus. And that means companies have to make a big decision. Where will I plant my company and where will I tell all the employees to come? For me, my first encounter with this was when I was a first-time CEO in 1999. Uh, in Silicon Valley, I had just raised $15 million. I needed space for my firm to grow and I ran headlong into a lease requirement of five years. I had no bloody idea what our company would look like in five years. I really couldn't predict it for three months. But I signed that lease, two floors, enough space to grow to how large I thought we might be. We never even moved into half the space. And so all that extra real estate I was paying for could have been employees I was hiring to build the business more effectively. Today, the reality of what companies need from an officing standpoint, yes, it's oftentimes headquarters, but they also need to put satellite offices in multiple regions. They also need, for startups, a place where the time commitment for office could be far shorter to keep pace with their growing firm. And as many of us probably know, 
Work doesn't just happen in the office anymore. It's not a place I go. It's something that I do. Regrettably, perhaps I can reach for the phone on the bedside table in the morning or before I go to bed at night and check my email. We all do. Right? Work is everywhere now. Internet is everywhere. Computer, you know, computing is portable. But sometimes places to a company that are needed. That's workplace in the unit of hours. Okay? Um, now, it so, so for companies uh, today, the old real estate model that last revolution bought us of 10-year lease commitments just doesn't fit. It turns out that the old model is also quite inefficient for building owners. A quick lesson on that. Uh, I'll use a story that you maybe heard in grade school. Teacher walks into a classroom and puts a glass jar on the table, fills it with rocks, and asks the class, is the, is the jar full? The class says, yes, it's full. Teacher then puts gravel into the jar and fills the spaces between the rocks, asks again, is the glass full? The class says, yes, it is. Teacher then puts sand into the glass. You know, the class is getting wise to this. Teacher then puts water into the jar and fills it up to the brim to show the class a lesson. Hey, if your life feels busy, there's always space to add a little bit more. That is the story of our built landscape today. The rocks are how we try to fill buildings, and we never fill them. We're wrapping up one of the best years in commercial office history here today in, in, with the strength of our current market, yet our commercial office building landscape is over 10% empty at any given time because you cannot fill a vessel with rocks alone. You need the gravel and the sand and the water. Those extra pieces sit there empty, yet the building owner pays for the entire building. But it's, it's worse than that. In addition to the empty spaces the building owner hasn't filled, there are unlucky sots like I was in 1999 that made long-term lease commitments. They're not only using half of the space that they leased. So from a sustainability efficiency standpoint or an economic utilization standpoint, very, very inefficient. Moreover, on purely environmental terms, the building model, the real estate model that the last revolution brought us is woefully inadequate under today's lens of sustainability. You've heard some of these numbers in a couple of presentations ago. 79% of US electricity consumption is powering our buildings. 39% of our carbon footprint on a planet that I'll tell you again is warming is going into the buildings that are sending woefully underutilized. In fact, and this is the grimmest statistic of all, even a building that may be leased 100% that companies are occupying, the reality is, based upon survey after survey, that the typical officer desk inside of an office workplace is only utilized 30% of the work day. It's to say nothing of the after nine to five. So um, what is, what's called for? What does the real estate revolution need to do? I think it's clear, we have to fill the jar. We have to fill the jar of the existing built landscape that's already out there, and it's well in play. The same patterns that have shown us how to transform things like transportation with apps in our pocket are also now transforming real estate. And the two big pieces that were needed were, one, let's use technology, let's use networked communications to rethink the way that real estate transactions can happen. Let's put it online. The internet now is where office transactions can happen. The second piece is a bit less sexy, but no less critical, and that's the legal framework. Part of what held us behind and held us so long in the old revolution's model of long-term leases was that lease document. Every commercial office transaction requires attorneys on both sides, brokers to interpret a custom contract just to occupy an office. That's being done away with now as standardized and simplified models that are akin to the contract that you might sign at a Marriott hotel are, are sweeping through real estate. Online, simple, and end-to-end. -end. So what's it look like from the front lines? Well, I'm, I'm happy to share that the owners of buildings and the companies who have put leases out are embracing this revolution. Those, those spaces between the rocks are starting to become available. Companies are putting those empty spaces onto platforms like Liquid Space. They are finding a way, they have a motivation to fill those empty slots. And likewise, to the professionals on the go, to the CEOs of startup companies and the real estate heads of large enterprises, they too are embracing the, real estate, the, the, the revolution. They're giving their employees mobility and choice. They're, they're looking to make more efficient uses rather than just numbly signing up for long-term commitments. And so at these periods of revolution where new ideas sweep in and where the fabric of society is rewritten, oftentimes there's an old guard that's swept away. And you can plot that with peaks. Economists today are pointing at peak oil, for example, a point when oil production and demand is actually falling off. In fact, they think we may have hit it. Likewise, with the advent of revolutionaries like Uber and Google and Tesla who are working on autonomous cars, people are actually talking about peak car, and it may be that we've already hit peak car. With my passions applied into office and many others out there working on similar things, I think we can now look in this revolution at the phenomena of peak office. And looking backwards for the last hundred years, 
I'm ready to characterize that as the rise of the industrial real estate complex, where we built big things. We built dams and highways and skyscrapers, but we did so without any accountability to sustainability, economic or environmental. But today, with the new flexibilities that are being applied to how the built landscape can be used, with things like the Airbnb of office happening, um, I think we're going to be able to characterize this era as the great era of unbuilding. Let's share and utilize and harvest the buildings that are already constructed, and let's all delight in that. And so um, hopefully 10, 30, 50 years from now, someone on a stage in the future or some historian will look back on this era and to some of the crazy ones that were out there that dared to imagine a new model for real estate. And my hope is that they will be able to look back and see this as a period, as an outcome where more happy people were working in fewer buildings and the planet smiled back at us. Thank you.